Sure. I just want to welcome you all and thank you for coming out. We are ready to begin our lecture and demonstration. I'm going to turn it over to Sherry and she will tell you more. Thank you, Carla. And again, welcome to everyone. We're so glad that you're here. We have a uh, um, full evening planned and a full week. We, just to go over what we're going to be looking at this week, our focus is on what is the best lifestyle or optimum lifestyle for optimal health. That's what I believe everyone here is seeking for, right? Optimal health. So what we're going to be doing in our program, we'll be having health lectures, generally two a night. And then we'll be doing some wonderful re recipe demonstrations and you get to try it or take it home and have it the next day. We're going to be next week Sunday focusing on natural remedies and how to boost your immune system. And you don't want to miss um, on Saturday, on Sabbath, we have a full program planned. We're going to be talking about mental health um, at the 11 o'clock service. And then we're going to have a free lunch available. So please come on out, and then after lunch we'll be having another presentation on mental health. Um, during the time together we have great door prizes. Door prizes such as cookbooks, a uh, gift certificate to this wonderful um, plant-based restaurant. And so you don't want to miss that out, so if you haven't put your name in the basket at the registration table, make sure that you do that. And the benefit to having a smaller group, your chances go up from getting drunk. <laughs> That's a good thing, yeah! <laughs> and sorry for those who are watching YouTube and Zoom, you just, you gotta come live for the prize. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Alright, and then the topics we're going to be covering, we're going to be looking at the Blue Zones. We're going to talk about that more in this uh, next lecture. Blue Zones, we're going to be looking at areas in the world where people live the longest and what can we learn from their lifestyle. And so we're also going to be focused in on how we can help prevent reverse diabetes, heart disease, cancer, depression, anxiety, because the good news is an optimal lifestyle can do just that. You don't have to be doomed to diabetes. There's hope for you. And then, as I mentioned, next week, Sunday, we're going to focus on how to boost the immune system. Now, you notice, with these topics here, we're in this time of the pandemic. And for those who are dealing with diabetes, heart disease, obesity during the pandemic, you have um, greater challenges, I'll say it like that. There's a higher risk with the comorbidities. And um, at this time, I think all of us are wanting to know how can we boost our immune system? What are things we can do? This pandemic is um, something like we haven't seen before. And I personally believe everything we can do to attack it, <laughs> let's do it. Multifaceted approach. So we're going to be looking at um, those topics and we're going to be doing those activities. And uh, again, the times our meetings are running, I hope you all can come back. Monday night, and we have room for more, so invite your friends, your neighbors, your family, your enemies, bring them all. It'll be good for them. 6.30 p.m., it will start the same Wednesday at 6.30, and then next week, Saturday, um, at 11 o'clock, will be our talk on um, mental health, and then stay for lunch, and we'll have one other presentation, and then that is a typo. Next week, Sunday, we will be starting at 3.30 not 6.30, next week, Sunday, 3.30. So we'll fix that. And then just some quick announcements. Again, make sure you get your name in the basket for the door prize. And does everyone have a handout with your recipes and our song of health? We want to make sure everyone has that. And if you don't, someone can give it to you. Also, we're going to be having opportunity for you to ask questions. I have a basket back there where you can write your questions in because that way gives me an opportunity to research your question well so I can be prepared. And it might be a question you ask that it might do well for me just to talk one-on-one, -on -one, not specific to the whole group. So if you do have a question that might be more on that line, one-on-one, -on -one, just feel free to ask 
talk to me after the program, and I'd be happy to spend time with you. And um, we, I think probably most of you are familiar with the facilities. We do have restrooms upstairs. Just go up the stairs, it's to your right. We do have water, the back table by the flowers. You're welcome to help yourself to a water bottle. Also, you notice on the registration table, we have a basket for donations. Now, the seminar is for free. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Salem Seventh-day Adventist Church, is actually sponsoring the seminar, and they want to provide it for free. But I always like to have a donation box. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, if you felt like it's a benefit, I like doing that so places like this church can do more in the future. So if you'd like to do that, you're welcome. There's no pressure. Just letting you know that's there and why it's there. You should make a check out. Who do you make it out to? Um, would be the Salem Seventh-day Adventist okay. Church. You could just do Salem SDA Church. Good question. All right, so that's all the announcements that I have. So what we can do now, we have a theme song. And what I love about this theme song is it encapsulates the principles that we're going to be talking about this week. Key lifestyle choices that we can make that can help with good health, and longevity. And what's wonderful about the song is the tune, you all know it, it's set to the tune of Jingle Bells. <laughs> so we can all sing together through the first time around, okay? And what's great is it's one of those catchy tunes that gets stuck in your head. And so this is going to be good. So I make a joyful noise, so the singers, I need you to come on in nice and strong, okay? All right, ready? If you want good health, nature's laws obey. All the precepts he never from her stray. Harmful habits shun. Do not push yourself. When too tired or you may find will put you on the shelf. Oh, health for you, health for me, health for all mankind. Healing for the heart and lame and vision for the blind. Help for you, help for me, help for all mankind. This circle of body, whole in spirit, flesh and mind. Take some time to play, stand straight, breathe in deep. Work while it is day, always get your sleep. Eat just what you need, never more or less. Moderation is the guide to health and happiness. Oh, help for you, help for me, help for all mankind. Healing for the heart and lame and vision for the blind. Help for you, help for me, help for all mankind. This our goal of body, whole in spirit, flesh and mind. Water is your friend, use within, without. Cleanses, smooths and heals, puts the germs to rout. Rest repairs the rest, stress of living brings. Loosens heart and ragged nerves and gives the spirit wings. Oh, help for you, help for me, help for all mankind. Healing for the heart and lame and vision for the blind. Help for you, help for me, help for all mankind. This our goal of body, whole in spirit, flesh and mind. Sunshine and fresh air. Clean and wholesome food, proper exercise, thoughts of right and good, keep the cheeks aglow, bodies fit and strong, keep the brain alert and clean and give the heart a song. Oh, help for you, help for me, help for all mankind. Healing for the heart and lame and vision for the blind. Help for you, help for me, 
helpful of mankind. This our goal of body, whole in spirit, flesh and mind. Ooh, oh, you guys sound wonderful. Very good. You guys can give yourselves a hand. Good job. Very nice. And we'll be learning this singing at every session, and you will know it by heart. And you'll be going to the grocery store, help for me. That's good. Very, very good. And again, for those who just came in real quick, if you're not familiar with the facilities here, we have bathrooms up the stairs to the right. We have water in the back. And make sure at some point in time you get your name in the door prize basket. We don't want anyone to miss out on that. And we have some other sign-up things there, too, that are great. So if you haven't done that, make sure you do it at some point in time. All right. And so, I want to, how many of you are familiar with the Blue Zones? You might have read about it in National Geographic, might have heard on television. Uh, I want to encourage you to definitely be good students, do research. Don't just stay with what I share here in the class that we'll be having, but do extra. If you, you'll find so much wonderful information just Googling the Blue Zones um, and even looking up on YouTube. And I'm just thinking, I have this magazine right here I want to show you. So I was at CVS the other day, and they had this um, Blue Zone National Geographic one available. And it is so good. Great information. Now, when I went to the checkout counter to purchase it, I bought two, because I was thinking, oh, that would be great to have two of these. It came up to $30. I said, ooh, no, we're going to get one. <laughs> so it's $15. It's worth the investment, but you have come to a free seminar where I'm going to be sharing a lot of information from this. So coming to a seminar like this saves you time and money. But if you want to get more information, great information in this Blue Zone, you can go on, like I said, Google, YouTube, find stuff out for free in the back. It talks about some other great books. That has to do with studying the world's longest communities. And as you can see here, they're outlined. We've got Okinawa, Japan, Ikara, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, and here in the United States, in California, Loma Linda. And we're going to focus a lot on in the United States because that's where we live. And the food that we have here available to us, I think we can have a greater connection. And Personally, myself, to share a little bit about me, I am a Seventh-day Adventist, so I'm privileged to be a part of this longest living community. And so that's um, a little, how would you say, qualification I have to be sharing with you. I'm just going to be sharing with things that I have learned throughout my lifetime as being a Seventh-day Adventist and health resources we have. I've had the privilege to work in the field of community health for... Um, probably for about, um, time adds up, about close to 20 years. It's what I studied in college. And I had the privilege of working at a lifestyle center in Arkansas for 10 years, northwest Arkansas. We had a facility where we would have um, people come and stay with us for five days. And it's amazing what can be done in five days as far as um, changes for the good with diabetes, um, with uh, blood pressure, people seeking to stop smoking with depression. If you get those basics done, and like we're going to be covering, and you just keep up with the program at home, you will see incredible results. Where our health guests were even able to get off their medications, mm -hmm. which was exciting, and stay off. So I worked there for about 10 years. About six of those years, I was the director there. We also traveled and did health seminars like this across the country. My good friend Earl, he was a part of those seminars that we do in Florida, and I think he even came out for a session or two in Arkansas. Wellness Secrets, right? Yes, at Wellness Secrets. And Wellness Secrets is still operating. You can check them out on the Internet. Um, great place. Highly recommend. 
And yeah, and this is just me giving a seminar down there in Florida. So that's a little bit of my background. I also lived in Honduras for about three years, worked for two years with a medical clinic in the mountains of Honduras. And um, I worked at a college where I was the ladies' dean and also taught health classes there. So I am very passionate about helping the community gain better health. My background primarily is in cooking. I love to cook and I love to eat. <laughs> and I love to keep it simple yeah. and affordable. So that's just a little bit about myself. And what we're going to jump into now is our first presentation getting into these longevity secrets, the blue zones. I'm going to introduce you to Dan Butner. He was the man that helped get all this started. He worked with um, National Geographic as an explorer, and um, he also is. Um, he did uh, bicycle races. He's a champion. I forgot his accomplishments. But um, for him, studying about the blue zones really exploded into something more than what he even imagined to where, to this day, he is helping cities across the United States implement these principles and seeing incredible results in wellness. And of course, he works with the team. And so, what happened was um, they had this idea, let's study these people groups, let's see what we can learn about them, and then, not keep it a secret, but share with the world. And that's what um, National Geographic has been doing, he's been doing through his books, and now Adventist Health, Ad Advent Health is a Adventist, Santa Adventist Hospital network that has purchased the Blue Zones. Yeah fits in that bag. Thanks, Carla. So, these are the countries that I spoke about, the different groups. Let me introduce you to these groups. First, in the area of Sardinia, this is a mountainous highlands of inner Sardinia, Italy, we're talking about. And here we have the world's highest concentration of male centurions. Let's hear it for the men. Yay. You know, to get men to be able to live above 100, that's wonderful. Normally, it's the ladies that live long, right? Mm -hmm. So this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> now, over in Greece, Icara, it's an island with one of the world's lowest rates of middle-aged mortality and lowest rates of dementia, which is fantastic. In, yeah, in camps, yeah. And then in Costa Rica, we have the world's lowest rates of middle-aged mortality again and highest concentration of male centurions. So men, Italy and Costa Rica are the places to be. And then, of course, with the Seventh-day Adventists in California, Loma Linda, we have the highest concentration of centurions around that Loma Linda region. Seventh-day Adventists tend to live 10 years longer, 10 to 12 years longer, than their North American counterparts. Now, thank you. How many of you would like to live 10 to 12 years longer, huh? Any extra year is a, is a bonus, right? So we want to find out more, and I'm going to just see if I can quick figure out how to use this clicker. And if not, I'm going to just use it with my hand. Yeah. Thanks, Carolina. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Thank you. And then, of course, Japan. For the females, living longest lived population in the world. It's incredible, and we'll look more into them. Yes? You don't have the ages? Um, I don't have the ages, but when we're talking about ages, we're talking about 103. Mm. I'm going to introduce you to some individuals tonight, 96 years old, still pre um, performing heart surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the doctor. Yeah, the doctor in California. Yeah. But no, in the National Geographic, you'll see the section on Japan, these dear ladies, they're, they're over 100 still a very active life. So we want to find out what are they doing and what can we be doing. And again, these are some books that are going over the studies and research that they have found. And so um, if you want further study, learn more, 
You can check those out. It's fantastic information. Now, I thought you all might be interested at the beginning. Here is a map of the world, and it's showing you life expectancy. So 40 below, 40 plus, those are those purple-blue colors. Um, poor Africa, you can see. We got low life expectancy right there. And then somewhere there in the Middle East, those who are better at geography than I am. I know that's like Central that's Asia. That's Afghanistan. That's Afghanistan. Okay, life expectancy not being long there could be understandable. And then <laughs> look over there with our China, Russia, Eastern Europe, Greenland, some parts of South America. It's still a little bit lower. I mean, to live to your 70s is a blessing. So uh, Central America? South America. Center? South and central, you got the green in this central too. Yeah. So, but now getting more towards North America, Western Europe, Australia, parts of South America, there, Chile, and all, you're getting more into the reds, and that's where we want to be going. Now, you might be wondering why is it called the blue zones? Really simple. They used a blue marker to circle the areas where they live long. <laughs> okay, that's that's all that there is to it. You have a question, Donna? Yeah, I was going to ask how much, um, not just genetics, but everyone needs to descendants like from Europe, all, mm -hmm. all, they all sell to the America. Does that have anything to do with it? Or maybe We're going to get into that. that. Oh, okay. We're going to get into that. Good nice. question. Okay. And I also want to have, just because of time, I love questions because that's how we learn. But we've got so much to cover. If you have a question, please write it down and I want to answer it okay. and we'll get to you. Now, I want to make sure everyone has paper. Does everyone have paper right now that they can mark on? Because I'm going to be asking you a question. You can use the back of your song sheet. Does everyone have something to write with a pen? Because we're going to be doing a little activity that can help you give an idea of measuring your life expectancy. Okay, you ready for this? We're going to be asking you some questions. And the good news is we can always change and improve. Okay, so let me ask some questions. I saw this done somewhere, and they had people raise their hands, but I don't want to raise hands. I want you to just mark, okay, on your papers. First question I'm going to be asked, if you sleep at least seven hours most nights, I want you to put a mark or a yes or a check, okay? If you sleep at least seven hours a night, most nights, that's a yes, okay? Mark that. Keep track of that. Next question or statement. If you move at least 30 minutes a day, doesn't have to be a gym, but you're walking, you're gardening, you're moving at least 30 minutes a day, you can give yourself a check, a yes, an indication. Next one. If you eat three honest servings of vegetables. That doesn't mean, you know, I'm just eating one spinach leaf, okay? An honest serving, at least three of vegetables, and that does not include french fries and ketchup. <laughs> okay? Give yourself a yes a indication there. If you have not had unprotected sex with a stranger, give yourself a yes or a check. Make note of it. If you belong to a faith, Christian, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, show up at least four times a month, give yourself a check. If you belong to a faith and you show up at least four times a month, meaning you meet with people. Okay. Number six, you have at least three friends if you have, if you can have a meaning that's probably not worded well. Do you have three friends that you can have a meaning conversation with? You can, thank you, meaningful, yeah. Can call them on a bad day and you actually like them. <laughs> You've got at least three friends that you like. You can call when you're having a rough time or share your day with, have a meaningful conversation with. Give yourself a yes, a check, however you keep in track. If you have not smoked tobacco in the last five years, Give yourself a check or a yes. And then number eight, you have the desire and physical capacity to live to at least age 90. Best single most predicate. If you have a desire, 
physical capacity to live to at least age 90. Let's just even say you've got the desire. Okay? All right. We've got all the marks. We're just coming in. What we're looking at is our possible life expectancy from studies. If you write yes to any of these questions, keep track of how many yeses you have, okay? All right. Everyone ready for me to go to the next slide? You want to take a picture of that? Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Ready? I'm going to move. So, assuming you're around age 50, if you've answered yes to at least two of these questions, and you're a man, life expectancy is 75 years. Female? 79 years. If you've answered yes at least five times, male life expectancy, 82 years. Female, 86 years. If you've answered yes at least seven times, male, 89 years. Female, 93. <coughs> That's fantastic. Now, if there's any who have done seven, I want to give you a round of applause. That's very, very good. Now again, we never know what can happen in life. But these, those things that I've mentioned, I think, was there eight questions that yeah. we had? Eight. Yeah, yeah, only eight. You know, a lot of those are attainable. Even if you're not doing them right now, they can be. Now, something as far as like with the friends, and you don't have those three friends, there's a proverb that says that he that has friends must show himself friendly. So just show yourself friendly to some people, and you might get some, the Lord might send some good ones across your path. And we'll talk about some places you can find some good friends as well. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to play some videos that's going to introduce us more to the blue zones, and introduce us to some of these incredible people that live well into their 90s, early 100s, with incredible, um, not just vitality, quality of life. It's one thing to live long, it's another thing to have quality of life with it. Yes? Talking about age. Yeah. Not because I'm age. Yeah. But uh, I talk. Instead of my husband, he is not here. He always said, hmm. the Bible said the strong person live around 70, 70. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, the strongest can be 80, but now never tell nothing about over 80. He's 82. I see, so he's doing good. <laughs> Bonus, too. He's 82, <laughs> and he said 80, but about 82 or nothing is telling. No. And I said, just ask that. He's going to answer you exactly the time. Right, right, right. But what? I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. That's fantastic at his age. That's fantastic. What I want to encourage everyone with is this, that um, the quality of life you can have with a good lifestyle is worth attaining and achieving. And you don't know the possibilities. Okay, we're going to look at some of these um, incredible people and uh, see what lessons we can learn from them. And here we go. Oh, wait a second. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm not that techy. What are you trying to do? I wanted to play, and when I click it again, it moves to my next slide. So, and we have made it play before. I don't know. If... Okay. So there it is there. But when I click onto it, no, we have played it before. But it was not maximized. Okay. So close it. You think? Yeah. What you could, is you could play it. I did. Yeah, see, it's moving to the next one. Uh, go back. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have to go right there? Yep. Okay, no, that's not nice. Oh, that is yeah. 
So one of the things we're doing today is revealing the secrets of the blue zones. It's the places on our planet where So, one of the things we're doing today is revealing the secrets of the blue zones. It's the places on our planet where people live longer and healthier lives. Blue zone number three is the only one in the United States. And where is it? Let's look at our map. It's Loma Linda, California. Check this out. So here we are, is your blue zone, Loma Linda. Loma Linda is located about 60 miles east of Los Angeles and where you'll find the group of Americans who live the longest. It's also where you'll find 9,000 followers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Adventists are Christian. Part of their core belief includes an emphasis on diet and health. No smoking, no drinking, no eating meat or processed foods. How are you doing? Hey, I'm good. I didn't expect to see you, Dan. 94-year-old Adventist, Dr. Ellsworth Wareham, can still be found in the operating room. He still does open-heart surgery. He's an amazing guy. I get ready to scrub in with Dr. Wareham to see him in action. What makes you different? I've been fortunate first, but I do try to follow a good lifestyle. For Dr. Wareham, that means a vegan diet, which means no foods that contain meat, milk, or eggs. And he spends up to 10 hours a week working in his garden. You're a Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah. How important <clears throat> is keeping the Sabbath? I think it's important for an individual to have some security and peace in his life. And, and I get that from believing in a loving, caring God, you see. Mm -hmm. And so if he's in charge of my life, why sit around and worry? You know, I mean, he takes care of the universe. He can certainly take care of me. So I don't worry. I don't have insomnia. I'm relaxed, you know what I mean? And I think that's a big factor. I think that if you're old, you should keep away from old people. <laughs> and if I keep with young people. You see, if I can keep around fellows like you, I'll be invigorated for days from having met you. God bless you. Let's go inside the office. You, you, you've been taking people into an operating room like this since before I was born. Yes. If you would retire at age 75, which is not an irrational thing to do, you think you'd still be alive now? I doubt if my health would be as good as I believe this is it now. And I am fearful to change anything I'm doing because I'm not only alive, but I feel good. Yeah. I'm not taking uh, any medications. <laughs> Very tiny when a doctor doesn't take any medications. <laughs> Let that be a lesson. That's important. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to be okay. Everything's fine. Well, Dr. Graham's done over 12,000 of these operations. Uh, and I'm, I'm a pretty busy surgeon. I'm not even close to that. And if you think about role models in your life, especially for me, he's an art surgeon. That's him. Dr. Ellsworth Wareham is here with his wife, Barbara. Dr. Wareham. <laughs> and how long have y'all been married? 58 years. 58 years. Wow. Fantastic. So what is your, uh, your best relationship advice? You've been married 58 years? You can write a book about that. <laughs> Well, I think one of the things you, sh you should do is accept people as they are. Don't try to change them. We all have different backgrounds. We have different genes. Let the person be who they are. Let them be who they are. That's a great, great. Do you ever wish your husband would just uh, come home and leave the operating room, Barbara? People ask me that a lot. And I just say, leave him alone. He's leave happy, him alone. you know. Let him be. I don't think he'd be nearly so happy just sitting at home. Wow. 
And that's what we're talking about for all of these cultures, having something to do that gives you a plan, a joy to be. Well, we, I talked to Ellsworth about this. By the way, you know, he trained at Columbia Presbyterian where I practiced, New York Presbyterian Hospital. And the buildings that are there, he trained with those people. It was like going through a history lesson to see how much he's seen in his life. And I think the key is you haven't retired. So you're doing the right thing. So working on sense of purpose, when, when you're, before you retire, knowing what your values are, knowing what your gifts are, and where to share those gifts, that's a great investment, a much yeah. better investment than you know, buying pills. Yeah. I have other friends who've retired who tell me never do it, and if you're going to do it, you better have a plan. Because you think you want to get off, you know, even Stedman says this to me, because, you know, I always think about, you know, when's the show going to end? And he was saying, you better have a plan. You better have a plan. And in these blue zones, there's, 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 uh, there's not even a word for retirement. The next blue zone we see, we'll see there's, the word doesn't even exist. There's wow. one word that views their entire adult life. So you don't even think about slowing down. Wow. Coming up, she's 103 and still pumps iron. Where do you meet Marge? Later, find out what foods are keeping uh, Loma Linda and Jung and healthy. Look at this. Wow. Okay, so we're gonna go meet Marge and uh, I might need your help, Corona, to do what we were doing. Uh, let's see, part two. Oh, it did it automatically. Okay, sorry, thank you. Loma Linda, California is America's only blue zone. That's where Dr. Mamet Oz met 103-year-old Marge Jatan. Oh! <laughs> the Queen of England. <laughs> the Queen of England. When I first meet Marge, I can't believe she's 103 years old. It's hard to keep up with you, Marge. <laughs> then I see her daily exercise routine, and I'm really blown away. So how, how long do you do this for? Seven or eight miles. Seven or eight miles. Yeah. You know, your heart rate is not fat even now. You're biking 25 miles an hour. You know, it's impressive. Most folks watch the program, I don't think, can go 25 miles an hour. Take my jacket off? Yeah, don't go off. Or just get it off. Just get it out. Oh, now she's getting serious. At 103, Marge is an absolute dynamo. I don't think they're right, Megan. They're very big. They're priceless. You never buy. I can't. I'll be hired. Okay? I think I think you had enough. No, I'm not big. <laughs> Marge turned 104 years old just a few days ago. Happy birthday, Marge! <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And uh, I, I hear one of her secrets is that she volunteers a lot. Her husband, after 77 years of, of marriage, she heard a thump on the bathroom floor and her marriage ended. And she mourned, of course you're going to mourn after that long, but then she said, I, I realized the world is not going to come to me. I need to go to the world. Mm -hmm. And the two days I spent with her, we barreled down the San Bernardino Freeway in her 1994 whoop your colored Cadillac. She's wearing aviator glasses <laughs> and she still volunteers for seven organizations at 103 wow. so it's a wow. idea of helping wow so i understand gratitude's another big part of it too a lot of people there are very grateful yeah well i think this ties ties back to to their religion you know for uh 24 hours every week no matter how stressed out no matter where the kids need to be driven to they stop everything from friday night until saturday night they focus on their God, their family, their community, and then hardwired right in the religion. This is the Seventh Day Adventist. Seventh Day Adventist, right. Yeah. They're, 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 and then they take nature hikes. Mm -hmm. And the important thing, it's a routine. If you're not going to do it for a long time, don't even bother because it's not going to impact your longevity. So belonging to the right community where these rituals happen every week, that is the secret for adding good years. Just to play on this gratitude issue, it really is the core to happiness. I mean, at the end of the day, isn't that what it's all about? If you're grateful for the things that have happened to you, sometimes they're not always good, but you find lessons and meaning in them. And I think that community, all these communities that Dan took me to, shared that, that optimistic outlook on life, but also with a sensible outlook. You know, Randy Pausch taught us this, right? You know, hope isn't about a good outcome, it's about be making sense of stuff. And these people have made sense of their life, and they do Randy all Pausch, the time. the last lecture. Coming up, spaghetti with walnut balls, crab cakes without the crab, and shrimpless cocktail, a Loma Linden feast. That's next. Okay, we're going to be having a different feast today. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Oz and Dan Buechner say it, it was easy to understand piece. why Lo and Linda is a blue zone after seeing their unique grocery store at the center of town. It's full of bins and bins of locally grown beans and nuts and aisles and aisles of fresh fruits and vegetables. So everybody needs to stock their shelves with beans. We do, which are cheap, right? That's what yeah, you're saying. You know, here. people say it, it costs a lot to live a long time. It doesn't. You can go to any inner city store and you can find beans. For $1.99, you get a pound of beans, high in antioxidants. You can prepare them many, many ways, as we'll see in a minute here. And one thing about the market that was really cool is they sold these in big bins. So they didn't pay a lot of money for marketing and for packaging. It yeah. was the bin. So what, you just scoop them up? I'll put them in a plastic bag. Dizzy and variety yeah. too. It wasn't you know you weren't stuck with fava beans if you didn't like fava beans or you know. Okay, so here are some local delicacies. The Lo Melinda uh, Market Cafe sent over for us to try. It's almost all vegan, so everything you're seeing here contains no dairy, uh, milk, or meat. Okay, right. It's got. Now you actually you say you don't like tofu too much. I don't like tofu. Yeah. All right, here try this. For all the tofu makers, trust, trust me, <laughs> it's okay with me that you have tofu, but. This is tofu-esque, I have to tell you up front. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> we have another half. You don't have to get testy about it. It's okay. <laughs> I like that. It's okay. I got an okay. It's, it's an okay. It's not, I'm, not just, I'm not doing the hula there. <laughs> it's okay, though. Some of this is it's not the exact same as when it's made with uh, you know real meat or real fish, but... If you get used to the idea that this is a... Listen, coffee. I was on the vegan cleanse. Kathy Preston put me on a vegan cleanse this summer. And I, she sent her chef to me, Tall. Uh, it was the most amazing vegan food. I don't know what the product they, they, was they called. They make it with seitan. Oh, uh, seitan. I had some seitan. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And it, it has this texture. Unbelievable. Right, right. This I'm not like dancing over. Right. How about okay. this? Let's try this then. My goodness. Okay. What is this? Uh, this is a, another tofu variant. Oh, no, you go ahead. <laughs> 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 Okay. No, you know the big point. I'll eat the beans and the and the lentils oh. and stuff. How about That's the good. Church? How's that? No, you're gonna like this. Okay, good. Because it's got so much sauce on yeah, it. Like it, right? Okay. Is this a seitan? It's a, it's a seitan base. That's not bad. Uh huh. That's not That's bad. Not bad. It's like an A minus. Oh, beef, beef not, teriyaki. That's not bad. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and then the, the lentils you like. The oh, lentils I beans, love. Right again. Mm hmm And the other thing is, these foods are available all over the country. They happen to make a delicacy of it. Uh, in Loma Linda, but you can find it. We eat these foods in my house because Lisa's a vegetarian, and we, these are all easily findable. You get comfortable with them. And Does you know, that mean you're a vegetarian too? Well, I have trouble boiling water. <laughs> so I, I eat what Lisa makes, and she's a vegetarian. Okay. So if I go out, and I, I, I'd rather, if, I, if there's nothing else to eat, if I go to a banquet, right. if a choice is the side boiled, tasteless vegetable or the meat, I'll eat the meat. Uh huh. Because it's better than starvation. Yeah. But if I have my brothers, I feel light when I eat this kind of food. So do you eat a lot of beans at your house? You know, beans and, and the squash we talked about in Costa Rica and, and a lot of these seitan tofu uh, deals are mainstay at our house and a lot, an increasing number of American households. Okay. Beans. Add more beans to your diet and they're cheaper too. Yeah. In these beans. economic times, is that's a good idea. All right. Thanks again to the Loma Linda Market. The final stop on our Blue Zone tour when we come back as we go to break. Here's a recap of Loma Linda's secrets to living longer. Take a break from the rigors of daily life to relieve stress. Create a sacred time every week that's just for you. Also, spending time with like-minded people will help you feel supported and loved. Get exercise from low-impact physical activities on a regular basis. This will help you build strong muscles and bones, essential as we all age. Cut back on meat in your diet and add more nuts. This could cut your risk of heart disease in half. Put more plants in your diet. Two or more servings of fruit and vegetables per day can reduce your risk of cancer. And give back. Helping others instills a sense of purpose and can help stave off depression. Okay, I have one more video. All right, so here's a quick quiz. Which one of the following foods is absolutely killing your testosterone levels? Eggs, flaxseed, milk, bananas, asparagus, oatmeal, or chicken? 
And I know all those foods sound healthy, but the truth is one of them is completely dish. Okay. What is that, Kevin? Testosterone. <laughs> You don't, have, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> you, you guys can kill testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> Blue zones are areas around the world where a high percentage of individuals live to be 100 years old. Today on Million Ways to Live, we visit Loma Linda, California, the only blue zone in North America, where Seventh-day Adventists show the world that healthy living is possible in today's modern world. Dr. Ellsworth Warren, a 100-year-old Seventh-day Adventist who retired as a heart surgeon at 95. He's been featured in National Geographic on the Oprah Winfrey Show and been interviewed by people from all over the world. We spent the day with Dr. Warren and his wife to learn his secrets to his longevity. According to Dr. Gary Frazier's famous 34,000 person study, the average Seventh-day Adventist vegetarian male outlives their average male counterpart by nine and a half years. Must be the veggies, right? Not according to Dr. Warren. The reason why the California Adventists outlive the general population, I think is based largely on a spiritual basis. You have to come to this conclusion when you see that Frazier took and divided us up, and 50% of, of the Adventists in California eat meat. But the difference between the ones that ate meat and the ones that didn't was only 1.53 years. You have to put it down to more than vegetarianism. It's the whole lifestyle that counts when assessing Seventh-day Adventist health, but individual habits deserve attention as well. According to Frazier's study, the most important habits for adding years to your life are as simple as eating a handful of nuts every day and exercising. Dr. Warren talks about his daily exercise regimen. Now, about 20 years ago, out of Stanford became a paper, and this paper said if you climbed a flight of stairs 20 times a week, now that's only three times a day, you get me? It's pretty hard to live in a two-story house and not climb a flight of stairs three times a day. That you reduce your incidence of dying of heart disease by 46%. Despite living through two wars and a long career as a heart surgeon, Dr. Warren feels he didn't have a stressed life. And his wife of 64 years backs that up too. She says she's only ever seen him stressed one time. We feel it's his philosophy on life that must be the most critical component to his longevity. I'll take care of the things I can do something about and the things I can't do anything about, I'll leave alone. You do the best you can and that's it. All your being stressed doesn't improve the situation one bit. Ultimately, it's the attitude and perspective you take on life that matters the most. Dr. Warham's closing thoughts really sum up his positive outlook on life and of course, the pride he takes for his gardening. You can take control of your life and achieve what you want to achieve. You, you've got to you've got to look at things in proportion and see the glass being half full, not half empty. You see. Mm -hmm. You want to come out and look at my backyard? Yes. You ever wonder? Now I'd like to introduce to you, and I was preparing this, I was thinking, well, I have some long living relatives. Um, my grandfather Oscar Schmidt and his, my grandma Madeline Schmidt, my grandfather lived to age 99. He was still driving at age 96. <laughs> and my grandmother lived to age 87. Now my grandfather, I remember 
he was retired. He was helping my grandma. She needed eye drops. He would do the cleaning for her so she wouldn't have to. He had a garden. He volunteered at the library every day. And I remember he was reading a book, What to Do When You Retire. <laughs> I said, Grandpa, you don't need to be reading that book. <laughs> You've got a busy life as it is. But he, um, he loved to stay active. He was the librarian at AUC, Atlantic Union College, for many years in South Lancaster. He uh, started working there in the 50s as an English teacher and associate librarian, and he stayed. And uh, I believe he retired in the early 80s and kept volunteering until he was 96. So that was like around, I think around 2011, 2010, 9. He was still volunteering. Great quality of life. My dear friend Earl was one of his caregivers, and Carla too. I got to live with my grandpa the last six months of his life. He stayed in his home the whole time. He died in his bed with friends around him and family. And I just said, Lord, what a blessing to have him for so long. So that's me and my brother and my cousins. And um, this was taken probably, I don't know, maybe about three, four years before he passed away. But I can tell you. And I'm sure many of you can attest what a privilege it is to have your grandparents, great-grandparents, as long as they can have you. You know, so that's a great motivation for seeking um, long life, good health. This is an article that was done about him back in the, the 90s. My grandfather remembered when zippers were invented. <laughs> he was born in 1914. You always tell the story about, he was in school at the time. Zippers invented and put in boys' jeans. He said they had the greatest fun pulling each other's zippers down. <laughs> Someone was going to write a book about him titled From Zippers to Computers, what he saw in his lifetime. I want to read a little bit um, this article that they wrote about him. Uh, this was done in 2006. So, yeah, he was at AUC for more than 58 years. At that time, he was still volunteering four days a week, and he was 92 then. He uh, went to AUC as a college student during the Depression because he could work his way through school. He had come up from Connecticut, and, um, and eventually, after teaching some other places in New York, Pennsylvania, he ended up back at AUC. And uh, let's see, I'm just skimming through it while I'm talking. What keeps him going after all these years? Why does he continue to volunteer when he could be doing other things? And he used to say this, I like to keep busy. He smiles, as long as I'm able and as long as the library staff and students want me to be a part of their team, I will continue to volunteer. And he used to tell me the same thing. He said, Sherry, when you get old, don't hang around old people. <laughs> he said, I love going to the library because I'm with the college students and they keep me young. And he used to always tell me, don't ever get old, too. He would always say that. A special model he lived by, and he, and he did. When he was in college back in the 30s, he came into class one day, and his English teacher wrote on the board, life is but once, drink the cup, wear the roses, live the verses. And that was the saying that he really liked. So this idea is seize the day. Take full opportunity of each day God gives us. It says his aim is to make people happy, bring them sunshine. He does that quite well. He tries to stay upbeat because there's too much negativity in life, and he doesn't want to be a part of it. As well, Schmidt heeds the advice of Madeline, his beautiful wife of 62 years. She reminds him each day to keep his chin up. The library staff is very happy to have Oscar Schmidt as part of their team. He brings plenty of sunshine to all, and truly he did. Now I have one last video to play before we get into the recipes. Let me just see if I can get the title of it, and then we'll switch. Oh no, I'll come back. Okay. Let's see, you want to live to 100. You know, we practiced this yesterday and today, and it worked, but for some reason, not today. Um. Yeah, thank you, Carla.
my grandpa, I used to always ask him, how are you feeling, grandpa? And he'd say, with my fingers. Uh, <laughs> with the horses. <laughs> Dan Buechner. Okay, here we go. Tenderness towards your body and mind might also be the secret to living to a hundred. That is according to Dan Buettner, National Geographic Fellow and founder of the Blue Zones Project, a well-being improvement initiative launched in over 40 cities across the United States. It also inspired a cookbook called The Blue Zones Kitchen, based on the diet of people who live in these zones and who live long and healthy lives. And he tells our Hari Srinivasan what exactly makes these places so special. But then you have made a career out of figuring out what is the quintessential thing that has us leading healthy lives, long lives. So explain the blue zones, what are they? Well, the idea behind the blue zones was to, in a sense, reverse engineer longevity. Uh, something called the Danish Twin Study established that only about 20% of how long we live is dictated by our genes. The other 80% is something else, lifestyle, environment, what have you. So uh, with uh, funding from the National Institutes on Aging and an assignment from National Geographic, uh, I hired demographers to look at, uh, uh, go through uh, worldwide census data and identify places where people either have the highest centenarian rate or they have the highest middle age life expectancy, mm -hmm. factoring out infant mortality and so forth. And then once I identified these places, took another team of experts there to go try to parse out, try to find the correlations of, or the common denominators of longevity in these disparate parts of the world. So between Okinawa and Sardinia and Loma Linda, California, what do all these people have in common? Number one, I just finished a book on this topic, uh, uh, doing a meta-analysis of their diet. Uh, the four pillars of every longevity diet in the world are whole grains, sometimes corn, rice, wheat, greens, uh, gr most greens that we overlook in the United States, but. Uh, greens that you know we'd, we'd whack from our backyard they're making delicious salads and pies out of them um, tubers and like sweet potatoes and then I would say the most important longevity food in the world is beans or our beans beans of all kinds if you're eating about a cup of beans a day it's probably adding three or four extra years to your life expectancy. So besides the food that's going in their bodies, there's no magic specific exercise. They're not uh, watching the same uh, Richard Simmons videotape. To... <laughs> <laughs> that's me, no. <laughs> no, and shockingly, and by the way, I would argue that exercise has been an unmitigated public health failure. Mm. Fewer than 20% of Americans get enough exercise, yet in blue zones, uh, fewer, and some of them, fewer than 1% of people were ever obese. Here in the United States, 70% are, are obese or overweight. Um, they're, not, they're not intentionally doing exercise, but rather every time they go to work or to a friend's house or out to eat, it occasions a walk. They have a garden out back. So every day into their 80s, 90s, and 100s, they're moving gently, weeding or watering or harvesting. Uh, they don't have all the mechanical conveniences that have engineered physical activity out of our lives. There's not a button to push for yard work and another button to push for housework and another button to push for kitchen work. They're still kneading bread by hand and doing things by hand. And it's this idea of moving naturally all day long. Well, my team figures that they were nudged into movement every 20 minutes. But they're burning calories. They're just not going to the gym to do it. They're burning more calories than they would 30 minutes in the gym, but more importantly, their metabolisms are kept at a higher rate because they're moving all the time. You sit at your office uh, for more than about an hour and a half, your metabolism drops into a hibernative state. By the way, uh, on average, people go, even people say they go to the gym, it's fewer than a, twice a week. And then what about the sort of social aspect of it? In my book, Blue Zones, I actually identified nine common denominators, and they fall in essentially four categories. Uh, uh, they move naturally. Um, they have sacred daily rituals to reverse the stress uh, of everyday living. A stress trigger is something called inflammation, and if you're always stressed, it becomes chronic inflammation, which is at the root of every major age-related disease, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, even dementia. Um, so there, the Okinawans have ancestor veneration. They take a few moments to remember where they came from. The 
Icarians and the uh, Icaria is another one of the blue zones, and the Costa Ricans, Nicoya, they're taking a nap. Uh, the Adventists are praying. They begin each meal with a prayer. They wake up and um, and um, the the Sardinians just do happy hour. But either way, there's a daily time where you just slow down and uh, you let the, the the stress reverse course a little bit. Um, they also um, and, and I would argue this is the most important aspect. They connect, uh, and not necessarily intentionally. They live in communities where they're they're nudged together in social spaces. So the option to be imploded into your house um, on your device doesn't really exist. If you're not showing up to church or the village festival, somebody's pounding at your door. Um, they tend to put family first. And interestingly, in almost all blue zones, when you see people making it to 100, they have a very concentrated, solid, committed social circle of three to five friends. In some places like Okinawa, it's culturally uh, determined. They're called Moais, M-O-A-I, Moais. Do they make these commitments early in their lives, the Moai? So when you're, traditionally when you're five years old or so, your your parents bring you down to the village, uh, you meet four or five other people, a, a ceremony ensues, and um, for the, you're supposed to travel through life together. When things go well, good crop or a raise, you're supposed to share it, and likewise, oh wow, things go poorly. You, yeah, and you, we hear a lot about these social determinants of health, and it's come about 15 years after I wrote the book, but they're so important. Uh, loneliness. If mm -hmm. you don't have at least three friends you can call on a bad day, it shaves about eight years off your life expectancy, as bad as a smoking habit. So these things that we've kind of uh, overlooked because they seem too subtle to make a difference really come to the forefront when you're studying populations of longevity. So you're talking about almost the opposite of 5,000 friends on Facebook. You're talking about three real friends that you yeah. can call or that, that have that ability to sustain you emotionally. That's right. In fact, we have, with National Geographic, we created a happiness quiz called the True Happiness Test, where it takes about five minutes. But we asked the question about life satisfaction and then how much time people are spending on social media. And you see this very clear curve. People who aren't on social media at all aren't optimally happy. Up to about 45 minutes seems to be the sweet spot. A and day? after a day, suggesting that people, that they're using it just for maybe a little intellectual repose or to connect with some friends so they can later meet in real life. But it's very clear, after two hours of social media use, happiness drops off a cliff. Mm. And the least happy people are on there eight hours a day. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about how you're taking all of this knowledge that you've learned through these explorations, through these Blue Zone books. You're now applying it to different American cities that are willing and interested in trying to ha sort of almost hack their outcomes. So let's talk, uh, how did that happen? I'm going to tell you something now that took me eight, out, eight years to figure it out. In populations where people live a long time, it's never because they tried. They never pursued any of the crap that we try. They aren't, they're not on diets and exercise programs, supplements. Uh, longevity ensued. These 100-year-olds these have no more idea how they got to be 100 than a tall man knows how he got to be tall. So they are simply products of their environments. They live in places where the healthy choice is not only easier or unavoidable. So this idea that longevity ensues uh, became the organizing principle. In 2009, I got some funding from AARP and uh, the University of Minnesota School of Public Health to go about trying to manufacture an American Blue Zone. And the idea here was not to try to convince a whole city of individuals to change their behavior. You'll fail. It's never happened in the history of the world where you get a whole population to get on the same diet or exercise program. But we work on optimizing city policy, we certify restaurants, grocery stores, workplaces, and schools, and we get a critical mass of individuals to agree to, to optimize their home and social network. But in every case, it's permanent or semi-permanent changes to the life environment so people are mindlessly nudged into better behaviors hmm. all day long. And it works fabulously. So give me some examples. So let's kind of go through that list here. One was, uh, how do you change businesses, 
communities, uh, but let's, let's, let's focus on the workplace. Everybody spends eight or 10 hours a day. It's an enormous part of uh, how they perceive the happiness in their life. So how do you certify a business that is going to contribute to someone's either increased longevity or happiness? So to begin with, you think about how they get to work. We know that somebody who takes public transportation or walks has about 11% lower chance of dying of a heart disease than somebody who drives their car every day. So uh, in, in a Blue Zone certified workplace, uh, maybe you pay for your own parking, but you get subsidized if you uh, take a bus. And in some Blue Zones workplaces, they actually pay their employees to walk or take a bike, $5 a day, which is better than going to the gym, as we talked about. Um, the food environments, uh, when you're eating at work, are there some plant-based options or is everything pizzas and burgers? So we help them change the defaults. And then a very important thing, the biggest determinant of whether or not an employee uh, is happy at work is whether or not, not how much you pay him, not how much you promote him or her, but whether or not he or she has a best friend at work. Mm. So we have these techniques of putting employees together, organize them around their interests and their values, and then challenge them to walk and eat plant-based together. It works fantastically well. Mm. So if an employer does that, we give them Blue Zone certification. Important thing to realize though, is you can't rely on just one micro environment. You have to think of orchestrating the perfect storm of policies, places, and people for at least five to 10 years and changing that whole, that whole life radius, that whole city comprehensively with enough intensity before you start to see a difference. Right, so, so say for example, in that, in that company, if you are encouraging people to take public transit, there's got to be public transit options in that city right there. Or if you're encouraging them to bike to work, hopefully there are bike lanes in that city. So how do you change all of those policies or encourage all those policies? So working with cities, and we're now working with 50 cities, including Fort Worth, Texas, and Orlando, Florida, and Austin, Texas, we come to the city council and the mayor with policy bundles, they're essentially menus. We, we've learned the quickest way to be shown the exit to the city is try to tell people what to do. But when you give city council 25 different evidence-based ways for changing that city so, they, so the active option is the easy option uh, for getting around, it turns out that seven or eight of them are both feasible and effective. And our team is really good at driving that sort of consensus, identifying the, the low-hanging fruit, seven or eight policies, and then my team is responsible for making sure those policies get implemented. Um, a, a couple really good examples. In the United States, every street is redone every seven years on, on average. So you can either have really wide lanes, high speed limits, um, and traffic lights far away, or you can build wide sidewalks, a bike lane. You can narrow traffic lanes that slows down traffic. Uh, fewer accidents, less less uh, uh, pollution in the air, and begin to favor the streets uh, for human beings, favor the human being rather than just favoring the car. And if you favor the human, the human comes. And you can raise the physical activity level of a whole city by up to 30% by just optimizing the built environment. Yeah. So, and then when you think about this for kind of the bean counters, whether it's the treasurer of a city or if it's the CFO of a company, all of these things make a cost difference when people are healthier or happier. Is it less expensive in the long run? So look at the macro picture. We spend $3.7 trillion a year on largely avoidable diseases in the United States. 18% uh, of GDP and that number continues to go up. So it's unsustainable. Uh, in Fort Worth, Texas, our work occasioned about a 6% drop in obesity rate, about a 3% drop in smoking, and Gallup, uh, we don't measure ourselves, Gallup measures us. Gallup calculates that on average, each uh, year that we've been there over the last two years, we've saved the city about a quarter of a billion dollars in projected healthcare costs. But that took us five years to get there, but now it's paying off very handsomely. Uh, for an employer, uh, for like um, General Motors, their second biggest line item uh, right behind steel is their um, healthcare cost. So an employer loves the idea that you can bring down healthcare costs by optimizing the environment. 
how do you help people figure out how do I make a sustainable change in my life that contributes to my happiness or my longevity? So when it comes to happiness, to put it simply, if happiness were a cake recipe, and some of the ingredients are you need food, you need shelter, you need health care, uh, you need some mobility, you need some education, you know, about a college, less than a college education. Uh, you want to uh, uh, partner up with the right person, it's very important. Uh, you need a sense of purpose or meaning in your life and a feeling of giving back. But the variable with the most variability, in other words, the most important ingredient to that cake recipe is where you live. Mm. What I mean to say here is if you are unhappy where you're living, about the most effective you thing you can do is move to a happier place. And we know this because when you follow immigrants from unhappy places like Moldavia, moving to happy Denmark, or unhappy places in Asia and Africa, and they move to relatively happy Canada, within one year, their happiness raises to the level of their adoptive home. Their sex doesn't change, their age doesn't change much, their sexual preference, their education, their religion, none of the fundamentals of their life really change, except they moved. Hmm. So the point here, once again, is if you want to get healthier or happier, don't try to change your behavior. That will almost always fail for almost all people in the long run. Change your environment. And there's lots of statistically underpinned ways to optimize your environment to favor both longevity and happiness. And even if you cannot move, you could still change your environment. Yes. My grandmother used to tell me, show me your friends, I'll tell you your future. So if your three <laughs> best friends are obese and overweight, there's a 150% better chance that you'll be overweight yourself. Smoking is contagious, drug use is contagious, junk food eating is contagious, unhappiness is contagious. So proactively surrounding yourself with three or four friends whose idea of recreation is playing tennis or walking or, or bicycling, uh, uh, a, a few friends who are vegetarian so you're not always eating burgers and baby back ribs, and at least a couple friends who care about you on a bad day. That's the litmus test. When you're feeling crappy and your chips are down and you've been fired, can you call this person and they'll come see you or loan you money when you're out of money? So really curating that social environment is very important. All right, Dan Buter, thanks so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. Great information, great tips. Thank you. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to take one of those tips and we're going to do some movement. And while we're doing some movement, it's going to give Corona an opportunity to set up the technical stuff. I'm going to teach you all a coconut stretch, OK? So what you're going to do is stand on up. And Corona, you just do what you got to do. You record that too? OK, so to do a coconut stretch, all you have to do is spell the word coconut. We got to see. Yeah, you got to spread out. We got an O. Then we'll go C this way. Then we're going to go O. Down to make our N. You can just hang there and just, yeah, shake. Okay, then come back up for our U. T. Coconut. Very good. All right, you can take your seat. And we're going to, Tika's going to go wash her hands. She's going to help me do recipes, and then she's going to come up and glove up, and we're going to go into our cooking part of our recipes. So if you've got your recipes here and pen, take them on out, and because um, you might want to make some notes. While she's coming, I want to share, I, like I said, I love keeping things quick, easy, simple, cheap. Life is busy. This is one of my great favorite friends in the kitchen. This is a crock pot. It plugs in and cooks. While I sleep, it cooks. It's a wonderful relationship. What about mine? No fire, no problem. You plug it in. They're made to cook for hours and be safe. So this one here um, doesn't have a, I like that when they have a temperature gauge, meaning high, low, warm. You can get them at Walmart for like $15. Mm -hmm. 
And um, when I'm cooking, you know, just for myself for two, this is a very good size. So on those, how do you know it's already cooked? You know, because it'll be soft. So like with oh, this one, it's, it's, yeah, this okay. one um, will like, say I put cook cereal in this, grains, mm -hmm. it will cook overnight, six to eight hours. While I'm sleeping, it's cooking, I wake up, the house smells great, and breakfast is done. So grains that you can cook in here. You can do things like millet. Millet is an alkaline grain. I saved the bag. I wanted to show it to you. How many of you have heard of millet? Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. All right. Some of you have not heard of millet. So um, Bob Mills has it. I can pass this package around. Okay. Millet is an alkaline grain. It's gluten-free. For those who eat gluten-free, our bodies does best with alkaline foods. So most fruits and veggies are alkaline. It's your meat and your dairy that's more acidic. It's, it's a bland flavor grain, kind of like how rice is bland. They eat it in Africa, Asian cultures, very good. I believe in South America, too. Um, we're going to be sampling it tonight. Okay. I'm going to give you some millet. You could buy seven grain cereal. Or what I've done before is I've done a mixture. Say I take some oats or oat groats, um, take some rice, take some cornmeal. You could just make it your own variety. So with a crock pot this size, small size, what I'll do is I take one cup of grain to three cups of water. Put in your salt, like a teaspoon of salt, and then that's it. Now, if you want to put some dates in to sweeten it, if you want to put some coconut in it, you can. Or you can wait to sweeten it when you eat it and put your toppings, your coconut, your nuts on it. You could do that. But quick, easy breakfast. Also, I cook beans in here. Now, generally, my ratio for beans is one cup of beans to four cups of water. Okay. With the grains, normally I do one cup of grains to three cups of water. Okay. Is that in, in here? So in here, what you, you know, that's a good question. I don't, okay, yes, I did do that. On page three, crock pot cereal. So Tika's going to make us some tofu. Last night, Tika and Squishy were making all this tofu for you guys to try today. And what I'm using here is firm or extra firm tofu. You can find this in the produce <coughs> section of the grocery store. Um, you can get good prices of the tofu like in an Asian market. Okay, so you're going to go ahead and she's going to just put that block of the tofu <coughs> in. The picture. Okay, he's going to get it for the camera. Oh, and put your things, so be careful. Okay, the floor is a lot of second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's electrical. Okay, there you go. All right, so take the block out so the water doesn't go in, please. Try, so, try to show it when you are doing it so the, the camera can see. The camera can see? Okay. Yeah. So there's the tofu. She's going to just put it in. And then, you guys, it's just simple. Let's find the recipe. I think it's on the first page. I gave you two options of tofu, scrambled tofu. So this is like a replacement for scrambled eggs. Now, of course, it's not going to taste exactly like scrambled eggs because we're using different <laughs> ingredients, but it's a nice substitute. We're going to be doing the first one. Now, it calls for yeast flakes. And Kika, if you don't mind showing that to the camera. Yeast flakes is simply yeast, and um, you can get your B12, vitamin B12. Yeast flakes are high in your B vitamins, and it gives it, it just helps give it a nice flavor. Now, if you can, we got these. You can find yeast flakes at Market Basket, Shaw's. Most grocery stores nowadays mm -hmm. have it. If you don't have access to the yeast flakes, you can substitute it with the recipe below where you're using tahini, which is sesame seed butter. And that's going to kind of give you the same flavor that you're looking for. So Tika's going to go ahead and she's going to put in, why don't we put in our seasonings? <coughs> so she's going to go ahead. We made chicken style seasoning and that was out of the yeast flakes. The chicken style seasoning is in your recipe and while I'm talking about it, Tika can go ahead and put in two tablespoons please. And the recipe is on page two, on the back of the first page. 
And so it's just a combination of seasonings of one and a third cup nutritional yeast flakes, three tablespoons onion powder, two tablespoons salt, one and a half tablespoons basil, one tablespoon garlic powder, teaspoon oregano, half a teaspoon of turmeric for color. And for those who are watching online, you can just play it back and hear me say that again. Okay, so she put the chicken style seasoning in. Next what she's going to do is put in a fourth of a teaspoon of garlic powder. So she's going to be adding all these seasonings. So I have a fourth of a teaspoon of garlic powder. You see the onion powder. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Can you put um, mint, um, red chopped up uh, onion? Yes. Okay. And one, yes. And that's what we actually do. Now what I like to do is to saute my onion on the stove top. So it's softened and then I add it. Now there's two ways you can make this. You can either... Yeah, go ahead and just follow it while I'm talking. Okay. No, 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 this one up here, yeah? Then go ahead and fix it. Okay. Um, your question, two ways to make this. You can either make this on the stove top, saute your onion, once it gets translucent, add your tofu, and then add your seasonings. You could do it that way, and you're breaking it up. Or what I like to do is I like to make it in a casserole dish and put it in the oven so I don't have to stand over it and I can go do something else. Both ways are good. So if I was to do it in the oven, and this is what we've already done, is we've sauteed our onions ahead of time. And then like how she's doing now, in a bowl I have my tofu. I'm adding my seasonings, mix it all up, add my onions to it. Mix it all and put it in a casserole dish, bake it in the oven, 350, about 30 minutes, and you're done. Nice and easy. But like I said, you can do it on the stove top if you want. Again, you saute your onions, break up your tofu into it, add your seasonings, stir it around, you know, probably about good 15, 20 minutes by the time you cook your onions and do that. And it's very nice. And then you can play with the seasonings. I've added cilantro to the tofu, I like that. I've added smoked paprika to it, I like mm -hmm. that as well. You can just, you play with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she's got her seasoning in, so just go ahead and break it up. This is the fun part, it helps get rid of stress. <laughs> she's just going to mix it all up really nicely. And then we'll give you a look. Yeah, sure. I got the turmeric gun, so I don't want to. Yeah, turmeric stains. <laughs> So we don't want her to stain. Now turmeric is a great anti-inflammatory. Some of you might have heard of turmeric being used for like arthritis, inflammation pain. Yeah. Really great. So it's fantastic when you get it in your food. It's also an immune booster. Yeah, good for the immune system. We're going to be talking more about culinary herbs on Sunday and their therapeutic value. Okay, awesome. All right. You can switch your gloves and we'll go to the next recipe, but to give you all an idea, this is what we're aiming for. And if you mm -hmm. want to add more turmeric, you can, for a little yeah. bit more color, you yeah. can. If you want to use paprika instead of turmeric, you can do that as well, okay? Mm -hmm. If you want to add fresh parsley in it, that's nice for some color. If you want to use basil or the cilantro, no, good. really nice. And so I'm going to pass this. This is going to get put in the oven with the other batch of tofu that we have. Okay, now our next recipe that Tika's going to demonstrate is an easy one as well, which is, we're making granola. And she's going to go ahead and take nine cups oh, uh, uh, of Sherry, granola. If, if, when you're doing it, can you also identify what's being mixed and, uh, you know, what? Yeah, so what she's going to do is she's going to take our oats. Now we can use quick oats or we can use um, the rolled oats. Oats are very inexpensive, which is great. And she's doing nine cups. This is a two cup measurer. So, and I'm talking about recipe, the banana day granola recipe on page four. So she's going to be adding her oats, the coconut flakes, the sunflower seeds, the walnuts are all going to go in that bowl. And then we'll be putting our dates, our water, and bananas in the blender and blending it. What I love about this recipe is it's low in fat. It's um, a good one. It's not so sweet. Have you ever shopped for granola in the grocery store and seen the sugar content? In the serving size, they say like what? 
a half a healthy. cup of granola. Healthy. Yeah, and it has like, what, 10 grams of sugar in that half, and who on earth eats a half a cup of anything, <laughs> you know? I remember one time we were doing a cooking class, and I was with my friend Franklin, getting stuff at the grocery store, and I was being lazy. I needed granola to make a crisp. I said, let's grab something from the grocery store. All the granolas were so high in sugar, wow. and my friend Franklin's a character. He noticed there was more sugar in the granola than there was in the Cocoa Puffs. So what he started to do was go in the grocery store and say, ma'am, which one do you think has more sugar? The Cocoa <laughs> Puffs or the um, granola? <laughs> the granola did. You wouldn't expect that. We have to be label readers. Read your labels. And it always helps to, um, you know, make your own if you got the time because you know what's going in. So she's got her nine cups in. I, I do that, and I add uh, cranberries, um, the, the black one too. Yeah, raisins. Uh, raisins, yeah. and walnut, uh, sunflower, flaxseed. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Coconut. Okay, all that. I do a lot. Yeah, you can add, and that's what's neat about granola. You can either add it when you're making it mm -hmm. or adding it afterwards, as mm -hmm. she said. You know, you don't have to be limited to um, what I have here. Pumpkin seeds are great. They're high in zinc. Um, they, they have a lot of good nutrition. I like using sesame seeds. They had a nice yes, taste. I, I do. Yeah. Yeah. And they're high in calcium, yes. which is nice, too. too. So, um, but this is a basic idea we're giving you. Now, the coconut flakes that she's using, I like using the big chips because it just has a nice look to it, I think. And the nice thing about the coconut is in this recipe, what's nice is it's not exact. If she puts a little bit too little, too much, it's not going to make a big difference, honestly. <laughs> the thing that will make a difference is your salt and putting in too much liquid, okay? Granola can be very hard if you put too much liquid in yeah. it. It would be like a jawbreaker. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm demonstrating this recipe. I want you guys to see the texture once we put the liquid in so you get the idea of what we're looking for. <coughs> Sorry, we didn't have those open up. Ahead. So, so I okay. use almond milk for the... Yeah, meat. you can definitely do that. Um, almonds are known as the king of the nuts. Almonds are great because they're high in protein, low in fat. It's one of the best nuts. Uh, so you can definitely, when I'm at home making granola for my father, he's a diabetic, so I like doing the granola for him, me making it, not buying it. Um, I'll just use whatever I have on hand. I just take the concept of this is what I want it to look like as far as moisture when I'm done. So if I have applesauce, I'll use applesauce. If I have the milk, I'll use the milk. If I have the juice, I'll use the juice. It's, this is one of those recipes you can play with, which is nice. You can have variety. You can just jump all that in. That's I pretty much it. Mm -hmm. I add maple syrup, but I know it's not good because it's too much sweet. It's moderation, and moderation depending if you're a diabetic, salt. you know? OK, great. And salt? Yes, over here. Sesame oil is the same, it comes from the sea. Yeah. So I can use the, it's the same or it's the same? Yeah, the thing about sesame oil, it's wonderful as far as taste goes. It has a very distinct flavor. It's mm -hmm. strong. Um, I use it, excuse me, in stir fries a lot, Asian cooking. A little bit goes a long way. I don't know if I would use it in granola, the sesame no, seed no, no, oil. No. Oh, okay. No, I use it in the rice. I put in the rice. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. For rice, that's great. Mm -hmm. What about coconut oil? Um, you can do that. Or use coconut oil. You can use coconut oil. I like not putting oil in my granola. Not putting oil? No not oil in my granola. Oil. The reason no. why I don't like putting oil in my granola is because I'm using nuts. I've got my fat already. Okay. So why make it a higher fat food? Mm -hmm. We get a lot of fat in our diet normally, so places where I can skip, skip yeah. it, I'm going to do that. You won't miss it in the granola. I use okay. uh, olive oil mm -hmm. around the can okay, where I'm going to dump the, bananas. the mix in the water. And the yeah. So with oil, this is my personal stance on oil. The best oils to be working with are like your um, olive oil 
in your grapeseed oil when you're cooking to high temperatures. Because high, fr high, fr yeah, grape seed oil, it can take temperature better than other oils. Other oils can become carcinogenic, creating free radicals when it's cooked at a high temperature. Now, what I ideally like to do a lot of the times is I'll cook my food first and then add a little bit of oil for flavor. What just for some butter? flavor, huh? What about the butter? Right, in the pan, but my concern about the pan being wise about is when you heat the oil, you can cause free radicals. They're causing oh, a Yes. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. Oh, butter. With the butter. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, 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 um, I brought some of the kind of almond, almond, almond flour. Yeah, flour. definitely. See, that's what's neat about this recipe. You can just play with it. The concept is I want, you know, about nine cups of my oats, of my grains. If you want to be adding, um, they have wheat flakes, they have barley flakes. If you want to be using those to mix in, you can do that. Now, what Tika's doing over here is she's adding her water. She's adding the bananas, and then she's going to add the dates, and then we're going to blend that up nice, and it's going to be like a thick paste, kind of like applesauce in a way. Mm -hmm. And then we'll pour that in and um, mix it up good. Now, what I discovered that I love, because traditional um, vanilla recipes, they used to tell you to bake it in the oven on 220 and stir the cookie sheet every half an hour. <laughs> for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. To me, that's bondage. <laughs> what is that? What? That's dates. Uh, okay. She's putting dates, banana, and water in the blender. Okay. So, what I like to do, I have learned, you want to hear the secret? Okay. There is freedom from the kitchen. Mm -hmm. You put your oven on the lowest setting, whether that's warm, 170, or 190, as low as your oven will go. You put the granola in there on a cookie sheet. You can sleep, it cooks, in the morning you wake up, the house smells great, and the granola's done, you don't have to stir it. But that is for Good. how many things you do in your sleep? For what? how many people? Those are the things you do in your sleep. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Make life easy, there's more to do. So, Just what do you need? So, <laughs> yep, is it up? Yes. So you Where is this um, heat dates and water together until dates Yes, are good question. The reason why I did not do this is this is one of those nice, powerful ninja blenders. Okay. If you have a blender that's not as powerful, maybe like an Oster blender, you want to heat your dates up in some water just so they'll be softened and easy to blend. Right? Oh, okay. And that's all there is to that. Yeah, I just got to get this on. All right, there we go. We got it locked. I'm going to close the computer <laughs> so we don't have any. And then, yep, just press power. Vitamixes off of Craigslist 
I got one for $115, which was great. Like so, a refurbished one? No, the steer man was selling it and <clears throat> sold it to me for $115, and that was great. Yeah, really, really good. So what I'm going to do... Um, Okay, and she's just going to pour it in. Mix it up. And um, yeah, vitamin mixes are good. Now, I personally have a Ninja at home, and I like that. When we're talking about Vitamix, this is what we're talking about. This kind, they've got all kinds of Vitamixes out there. They're a great blender. Yeah, this one over here is Ninja, multi braid place. That's what. We'll let you know that's a ninja. Okay, let's see. Okay, I've got one more recipe I want to talk about. And Carla, if you could get me some gloves from the back, that'd be great. Gloves. <laughs> While she's stirring that up, I'm going to talk about this recipe over here. The pear cream sauce. That's what I have right here. The pear cream sauce, this is, I like this. This is nice to put on, um, and if you want, if it makes it easier, since you got gloves on, you can get in there and stir with your hands. And I'm going to need a spatula from the back as well. Spatula. If someone can grab a spatula as well. And, oh, here's, never mind, I got the spatula. <laughs> I got a spatula, I just need gloves. <laughs> Thanks. So she's going to mix it up with her hands so you guys can get the consistent. Oh, I have the special so you can squeeze it out. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Pear cream sauce. I like putting this on my cooked cereal. That's very nice. And um, also you can put it on your waffles, pancakes. Super easy. And I'm just showing you how easy all this is. So what we're simply doing is, now in your recipe, Again, for the pear cream sauce, can someone find it and tell me what page it's on? Three. Thank you. Page three, pear cream sauce. Now you can use Sorry, fresh... Can you cashews ahead of time? Yeah. Okay. So with your pear cream sauce, you can use fresh pears if you want, if they're nice and ripe, or I use canned. Now in your recipe, it says to drain the juice in a pot and warm it. The reason why it's saying that is some blenders aren't super strong to blend the cashews up nice and smooth. And having the liquid warm will help it be smooth, but again, I have a nice Vitamix here. I'm gonna skip that step, and I'm just gonna dump it all in, yes. So you say the cashews, the raw cashews, right? Yes, good. You say soak it first? Some people soak it. I like to do is rinse it, rinse them. You can soak, that's very good to do, and I didn't, I didn't um, so if you could do that for me, Kyla. I have wonderful friends helping me. Yes, one cup, rinse it please. And so she's just gonna rinse it. Those are raw, unsalted cashews, okay? And again, we got those at Market Basket for a decent price. So you just rinse it? Yeah, I just rinse it. Oh. Some people like to soak it. You can soak it. But you don't need to. You don't need to. And again, I... Yeah, you know, whatever floats your boat. I'm more of the... Efficient, quick, easy, in and out, because I've got more to do than cook type cook. But there's others who are um, like to do things another way, and that's fine. But for me, I like quick and easy. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is simply put two tablespoons of honey in. Yes. Can you substitute agave for honey? You definitely can. And is it the same ratio? Yes. So agave is simply a sweetener that comes from a cactus. Okay, oh, really? so you have that option. They sell it, and generally they sell it where you find syrup in the grocery yeah. store. You can find that there. Yeah, you can substitute that. If you want to use maple syrup, we're in New England, you can do that too. If you want to skip the sweetener, you can do that as well. Yeah. Okay, and Carla just wash those for me. Thank you very much. Down through yeah. there. Okay, Chica's going to bring this around to show you guys. I want you to see the concept is it's like <coughs> damp. It's not super wet, okay? I want it just damp. Because again, if it's too wet, it's going to be very tough once you break your um, 
I need it. Okay, while she's passing that around, I'm going to make some noise and blend this. Huh. Once it's corona <clears throat> deeply, is this plugged in? <laughs> Fear is an object lesson. You gotta be plugged into the power <laughs> to work. Okay. So you idea it, it's damp. It's not saturated. Okay. If I can clump it, I've got too much liquid in it. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm gonna make some noise and I'm gonna add my cashews. Now, if you wanna do something besides pears, if you wanna do peaches, you could do that. What's that? Those are the cashews. Oh, the rinsed cashews. Okay, so I'm going to make some noise. to do to test if something's blended well, and I'll be doing the door cards quick after this. Mm -hmm. What I like to do is, if I have a spatula, but I don't, so I'm going to improvise with this spoon, I'll just take a little bit and put it on my finger, and just oh. rub and see if it feels, thank you, <laughs> and see if it feels gritty, sandy. If it feels sandy like it does right now, I want to blend it a little bit longer. Okay. Yeah? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to blend this a little bit longer. the blades. Right. Yeah. How many of you have ever given your spatula a haircut? Oh, yeah. yeah, a lot of times. So this prevents it from getting down to the blade, which is really nice when I have the lid on. So again, I'm just going to dab my finger nice and smooth. We're good to go. Now, if you want, you can warm it up on the stove top and serve it warm. I personally like it like this, but I have a friend who loves it hot. So whatever you know suits your palate. So what is that? What is it you just made? So this is called pear cream sauce. Page four is it? Page mm -hmm. three. Three. Thank you. Page three. Ways okay. I like to use it. I like to put it on my cooked cereal. You can put it on your oatmeal, your millet. It's nice. Put it as a waffle topping, as a berry topping. I just had an idea. If you only took it, um, experiment. I've got. Say if you want to take chia seeds and soak some pear cream and sauce, pear cream mm -hmm. sauce. Okay. and you want to soak some chia seeds in it, that would make a really nice, easy breakfast. Okay. Any other questions about the recipe? What kind of seeds do you have? Chia seeds. In your recipe, oh, yeah, yeah. I've got chia seed pudding. And again, that's a nice, easy, quick breakfast or dessert. Mm -hmm. And I have that listed. In it, chia seeds. Um, Carla, if you could get me the chia seeds. Chia seeds are, not everyone does. Chia seeds, uh, yeah, the little black seeds, she's getting them for me. And um, they're a little, little seeds that are high in nutrition, um, high in protein. They're great. Also high in omega fatty acids. And um, a little bit goes a long way. Oh, yeah. Pass oh, it around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Chia. Yeah, you're all yeah. Yeah. Chia. Chia. I didn't hear the chia. Yeah. Yeah. I got the chia. No, sorry, chia. Oh, I do want to pass it around. I didn't have 
Yeah, it thickens. It's kind of like the concept of tapioca, but you don't have to cook it like you cook tapioca. It just it just soaks. And I have directions in there how to make a plain. I got it. That's okay. So um, really great that way. You can use it as a dessert. Or you can use it as a breakfast food, which is really nice. Now, any other questions about the recipes we just talked about? You can do pistachio? Pistachio, if it's raw, I think I would do pistachio if it's not salted. Because normally pistachios are salted. But I only salted. Yeah. How come some of the seeds are white? Good question. I guess it's just the way it is. They're like that. Yeah, oh, they're like that? They're like that, she's they're saying. Like that. Oh. Okay, at this time. Okay, I had a question. Yeah. About the mixer. Yeah. Which one is the best? Champion, I like the best. But I still like the ninja. Yeah. Alright, so I'm going to now ask. I've got Squishy to come help me. Squishy, you see that basket that has a handle on it? Can you please bring that up for me and bring those two gift beds? We're going to um, do our door prize. And any other questions? Yeah. All right. So Squishy's going to help me out with this. Plant-based products. Okay. We're going to just move into part two while they're getting the food ready to serve. And what I want to highlight in the second part is just review what Dan Buettner talked about. He said they learned that there were nine common lifestyle habits that these blue zone groups had in common that they believe helped towards longevity. And he said these nine can fit into four categories. And we're going to go again briefly through each one of these nine, okay? So the first one we're going to look at is people moving naturally. It was just part of their lifestyle. They're not just thinking, all right, two, three times a week I'm going to the gym. They are, it says that they have figured that the average person in these blue zones are moving every 20 minutes. And that means not hearty exercise, it just means movement. And again, you know, they're not paying someone to do their cleaning, they're doing the cleaning. Or they're not having these machines um, to be doing the work that needs to be done. So exercise is just part of their lives, which is great. And then something else they had common, and I'm sorry, I just want to... Get my slideshow where. Okay, there you go. Something they have in common as far as purpose. Purpose means values, mission, vision. The Okinawans call this, um, no, I'm not Japanese, so I'm probably going to say it wrong, but Ikaya. And those in uh, Costa Rica call it plan de vida. For both it translates to why I wake up in the morning. Purpose. Adventists had the conviction of God's wonderful plan in their lives. Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you success. So knowing, having a sense of purpose is worth up to seven years of extra life expectancy. Okay, belonging. All five of the 2263, all but five of 263 centarians that they interviewed, so they interviewed 263 people who've lived up to age 100 and above. All of them but five belong to some faith based community. Research shows that attending faith-based services four times per month, so that's like once a week, will add four to 14 years of life expectancy. 
Now, as far as diet, the majority of these people are eating 95 to 100% plant-based foods. Beans, including fava, black beans, soy, lentils, are the cornerstone of most centurion diets. Meat, serving sizes are like three to four ounces. It's small, about the size of a deck of cards. So we're emphasizing the fruits, the vegetables, the grains, the nuts. Now this is a very interesting principle from the Japanese. They call it Harahachibu. The Okinawan 2,500-year-old Confucian mantra said before meals reminds them to stop eating when their stomachs are about 80% full. What we've recommended before to people is you feel like you could eat a bit more, but you're not going to. So you're not walking away from the table stuck. If you're hungry, when next meal time comes around, that shows you that you didn't overeat. You know, now there's some who've gotten used to eating a lot, so that might take some time to get used to. Now, um, so looking about being 80% full, the 20% gap between not being hungry and feeling full could be the difference between losing weight and gaining it. People in the blue zones eat their smallest meal in the late afternoon or early evening, and then they don't eat any more till the rest of the day. And we'll talk more about that later on. Many times, I think here in the Western world, we've especially gotten it reversed, and a lot of times our heaviest meals at night. And I know for my father and stepmom, that's the way it was, because of her work schedule. They'd be eating their heavy meal, like at 7.30, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, bless their hearts. And my dad got to be 330 pounds. Wow. In two years, because believe me, he's not strict, <laughs> but in two years, he's lost 100 pounds. Wow. What have we done? A good-sized breakfast, a good-sized lunch, supper is light, if not at all. And then, majority plant-based. He eats meat here and there, and he has his little snacks here and there. That's why it took two years to lose 100 pounds, but it still worked with some exercise, Donna. Um, I've read diets all my life, and um, one of the ones that uh, recommended is uh, six meals a day. Yes. Very small. Yes. Like every three hours right. or something. Is that... That's a very good question, and we're yeah. going to hold on to that question, because we're going to touch on it in a few more slides, okay. but tomorrow I'm going to especially hit on that, because you're right, that's been very popular, this idea of having small meals throughout the day, but we're going to be talking about, um, about that. Okay, good question. All right, now looking at loved ones first, this is very interesting. Successful centurions in the blue zones put their families first. This means keeping aging parents and grandparents nearby or in the home. Mm -hmm. It lowers disease and mortality rates of children in the home too. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a blessing. The younger ones can be learning from the older ones, and the older ones are blessed by having the younger ones around. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Ideally. Ideally. <laughs> <laughs> they commit to a life partner which can add up to three years of life expectancy, and invest in their children with time and love. That's big. When you do that, they'll be more likely to care for you when that time comes. Something else that they found that they call right tribe social time, the world's longest living people choose or were born into social circles that supported healthy behaviors. And he touched on that. Okinawa's created moyes, groups of five friends that commit to each other for life. And it's beautiful. One of the videos of the Blue Zones, it shows these ladies in their hundreds in late 90s, and they've been friends since they were five years old. And they get together every night and talk over tea and talk about their day or reminisce. And it's just great support. Research from the Farmingham study shows that smoking, obesity, happiness, and even loneliness are contagious. So the social network of long-lived people have favorably shaped their health behaviors. 
What's neat is in a setting like this, you can be meeting friends that have that same like-minded um, towards wellness, like-mindedness towards wellness. And we're going to be talking with you all on how we're going to be having a follow-up program once a month. We're calling it Healthy Choices Wellness Club, where we're going to get together, share recipes, share our health information, and again, you're going to get that support network of friends that will be um, beneficial in keeping up with good habits. Okay, and then finally, the ninth one they have here is downshift. Even people in the blue zones experience stress. Stress leads to chronic inflammation associated with every major age-related disease. What the world's longest-lived people have that we don't are routines to shed the stress. For example, talked about how Adventists pray, go to church. The Italians, how they have their happy hour every day in the evening. They, they drink. They, do. they get together. Um, the people in Greeks, Greece, they talked about how they have a nap put in their um, routine. I personally do a nap. I, I do well with, my grandpa was the same way. I like to take a nap before I have lunch, not after. And I'll just take a 10, 15, 20 minute power cat nap. That's what I do. I can literally just 10 minutes, sometimes I even dream. And I'm up and I'm recharged on the way here. I took a little nap in the car and I'm good to go. So, but um, I personally have found prayer the best stress reliever for me. But looking at ways that can help shed stress, that's very important. Now, I'm really excited about what I'm going to be sharing with you all next. Taking all these principles, there's been new research, you could say, in the past 15 years that 15, 20 years, probably more on the end of 15 years, talking about B and D and F. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor. You want to learn about this, know about this. B, D, and F. What this is, is it's a protein that's thought of as a brain fertilizer. Okay? BDNF. BDNF helps the brain to develop new connections, repair failing brain cells, and protect healthy brain cells. So having enough BDNF around can even protect our brains from neural degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. More than that, when BDNF levels are high, acquiring knowledge is easy, memories retain, and people feel happier. What do you think about that? Okay. Indeed, BDNF can even be thought of as a natural antidepressant. No harmful side effects, affordable. Yes. I recently gave up coffee, yep. and I did go through the withdrawal. Yep. I had severe headaches. Bless your heart. And I have to say, though, that giving up coffee, I actually feel like I can retain more. I think better. I think, awesome. I think better. Yep. <laughs> your nervous system is improving, yes. not having that yes. caffeine there driving it. Good for you, Linda, because I know that's not easy. Now, when the BDNF levels fall, the opposite occurs. People have difficulty learning new things, dementia can occur, and then depression is much more common. Now, you want to know how we, what can we do, right? Yeah. It's what we've been learning about. And this is what's so exciting. BDNF can be increased by exercise at any age. Isn't that good news? Getting the right amount of sleep, nutrition, and dealing with stress in the right way. Let's look at this some more. So physical exercise, intellectual activity. Mm -hmm. You all coming to this health program, you're engaging in intellectual activity. This is something that can help increase your BDNF. Excellent. Social nurturing relationships face to face. Doesn't it sound like those Okinawans with their Maori group? You know, coming to church, programs, clubs, 
this world of the computer age technology where it's more screen, like um, Dan Buettner was showing, saying, the research is showing, more time on the screen, less happiness. We need to be getting face to face. Now, unfortunately, with the pandemic, this has caused problems. But I think we've all learned how to social distance, wear masks, and be careful. That's important. Also, sunlight. That's free, available, easy to attain. Then reducing stress, managing emotions, and getting at least seven hours of sleep. Donna. Question about sunlight. Yep. Obviously, for the next two months, we're not going to see a lot of sunlight. Right. Do you recommend vitamin D yes. supplement? Yes, vitamin D3. I recommend vitamin D. Yes. Most people are low. What's ideal is get your blood tested. Find out what your vitamin D level is. That's ideal if you can do that. And then your doctor will know how much you should be on as far as supplement. That's ideal. Because vitamin D, most people are deficient. It is a fat-soluble um, vitamin. So you want to make sure you get in the right amount. Okay? Um, we're going to be talking more about this on Saturday. Sabbath, I'm going to be talking about depression, sunlight, and alternatives to sunlight when it's dark. Talking about blue lights, different lights that you can buy that can be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but it doesn't generate vitamin D. Does no. It? So no. your supplement's good. Yeah. Then again, gain also again gain at least seven hours of sleep. Now, what was interesting? They were doing this research that they found, and this was working with rats. They found that if people if the the BDNF levels in their rats went up when they exercised, even when they weren't getting enough sleep. Mm -hmm. What we can learn from this is if you have to choose between exercise and sleep, it would be better for you to get a half an hour less sleep and get that half an hour of exercise and squeeze it in, okay? Exercise does so much good for you. Okay, and it's particularly true in postmenopausal females. Now, this is also interesting. Research that's been found in finding that fasting can help raise BDNF levels. Now, what kind of fasting are we talking about? Mm. This is intermittent fasting. Many of the beneficial effects of caloric restriction and fasting appear to be mediated by the nervous system, good for your nervous system. Intermittent fasting results in increased production of brain-derived BDNF, which increases the resistance of neurons in the brain to dysfunction and degeneration. So, bottom line is this. Resting our gut periodically throughout the day, not eating like those six meals or snacking, we actually do better not eating between meals or having these five to six hours in between your meals because this is like an intermittent fast, yeah. okay? So your body increases um, makes more of this BDNF, and you're resting your stomach. It says, look, through daily fasting triggers a cascade of hormonal events in our body which boosts our body's repair mechanism. BDNF can go up with as little as 12-hour fast and could go up even more with a 17-hour fast. That's a typo. We want that in. So how do you get 12-hour fast in? Well, if your last meal is at 6 o'clock at night, right. Yeah. And you don't eat again till 6 in the morning or later, you got your 12 hours. Yeah. Now, for me, I eat two meals a day. Yeah. Daddy and I, because of our exercise program, I live with Daddy. <laughs> and so um, our routine is normally we're eating breakfast around 9, 9.30, because we ride our bikes five, out, five miles before breakfast. And then we're eating lunch around 2 or 3. Mm -hmm. And then that's the last meal of the day. Mm -hmm. That's the last time I'm eating food. So if I stop eating by 3 o'clock and I'm not eating breakfast again till 9, I, I easily have that 17 hours, you know. You can eat breakfast at 8, lunch at 2, and there you go. What does that meal look at like at your second meal? I eat a hearty breakfast and I eat a hearty lunch. Like what that could look like, I could be eating rice, beans, vegetable salad. This week, you're going to see what it looks like in the foods that we're going to be eating. Okay, and then again for the diabetics, this is fantastic. Um, BD, DNF can help you with your diabetes. We want to increase it. And this gets into um, 
a lot of complication. The bottom line is it's going to help you. Higher BDNF, less dementia. We all want that. So I just was excited in learning about the BDNF. It's basically applying the principles that we talked about in these blue zones that's going to help increase this protein that really helps with our health. Now, I like this quote. It was Dan Buettner has this on his website, Blue Zone's website. It says, to make it to age 100, you have to have one, you don't, oh, sorry, typo. To make it to age 100, you don't have to have won the genetic lottery. Someone asked a question about genetics earlier. Mm. But most of us have the capacity to make it well into our early 90s and largely without chronic disease. As the Adventists demonstrate from Will Melinda, the average person's life expectancy can increase by 10 to 12 years by adopting a blue zone lifestyle. So I, he spoke about this study done with twins in Scandinavia, I believe it was Sweden or Dan Denmark, in Scandinavia with the twins. And they found longevity was not, only had a 20% factor in longevity. 80% was having to do with lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I've heard it said another way, genetics loads the gun, lifestyle pulls the trigger. Mm -hmm. Lifestyle is what we put into our body and what we do with our body. Mm -hmm. Something we have control over. We don't have control over our genes, but praise God, I can have control over the lifestyle with I believe, with God's help. And that leads into this section here. I've been talking about the research National Geographic has done, and they're focusing on Seventh-day Adventists specifically, because that's what I'm familiar with as a Seventh-day Adventist. These principles that we follow are found in God's Word. It's not that Seventh-day Adventists have some kind of secret. It's available. It's in the Word of God. We're going to be looking at these principles as we go along. Truth is truth. And um, that's God... Our that's our manual. Earl, <laughs> you said it. It's our life instruction manual. I love this. Basic instructions before <laughs> leaving <laughs> Earth. Read it carefully, and I like this. I found this on the Internet. Contains necessary operating instructions and warnings from the manufacturer. <laughs> so just the same way makers of automobiles have a manual for the vehicle. What's the best gas? What's the best oil? How to maintain it? The Word of God, He's our creator. And he knows what food we do best on, what life. The Bible even talks about in Ezekiel how much water to drink. It's neat. It's everywhere. And we're going to be looking at these principles this week. I like using the acronym God's Plan. Mm -hmm. It sums up nicely what we've been talking about tonight. Godly trust, open air, daily exercise, sunshine, proper rest, lots of food, always temperate, nutrition. And you can find each of these principles in the beginning of the Bible, which is really neat, in Genesis. So we're going to be looking at the therapeutic value and application of God's plan. Modern day science is validating what has been in the Word of God all along. It's catching up to it. So whatever resource you want to use, whether it's National Geographic or the Bible, you're going to be coming to the same conclusions. With studying these people groups, the proof is in the pudding. You're seeing people who have had incredible health, incredible quality of life, and they're doing these things. So I want to encourage you tonight, as we're ending, to take care of you. You are valuable. Many times, we put others first, or we neglect ourselves because of work or whatever. You are important, and your health is one of the greatest treasures you have. Mm -hmm. You lose your health. You can't work. You can't do this and that. Health is a treasure. So it's worth, I had, I used to work with um, this couple doing cooking classes in the United States, and we did some abroad as well. And I remember Mrs. Heathman used to say, you're either going to take time to stay healthy, or you're going to take time to get sick. Which would you rather do? <laughs> to me, staying healthy is a whole lot more fun than the aches and pains and everything else that comes. And to help facilitate you in that, 
We are going to have a Healthy Choice Wellness Club that Carla's going to be leading out in. And we'll talk more about it as the week progress. But what she sees in vision is meeting once a month, sharing health information, encouraging one another, maybe have recipe demonstrations, recipe sampling, maybe having a potluck where you all bring a healthy dish that you've been trying. But there really is something to community and supporting one another. Mm -hmm. And whether you all meet here or somewhere else, I was just going to say this for tonight, there's plenty of room and plenty of food. So again, invite your friends, your family, your neighbors, co-workers, and your enemies. They can all benefit from it. Now, before I look close, because it looks like the food is ready, I just want to see, is there any other questions regarding what we spoke about tonight? Yes. Yes. I want to ask a question about, um, like, um, I have a problem of eating on time because mm -hmm. I moved from Florida. Yep. Well, I used to eat more regular because I saw my son. Yep. I've been alone now. Yes. And I get up in the morning and say, okay, I'm going to eat some, you know, some oats and stuff. Yep. But then I change my mind, I don't have an appetite. Yeah. I used to try to at least eat, you know, um, some nuts and something yep. and a fruit or something. Yep. But I just get, well, as I look at the food and I say, I don't feel like cooking it. Yeah. I'm so used to it. Even all my children are all grown. I friends. hear you. Nobody here. I hate. Being and I, you know, me living with my father, that does help motivate me more because I have someone yeah. else to cook for. But there has been times where I've lived alone or I had a roommate, but she was cooking her food and I was cooking my food. And for me, Doris, it was taking quick, easy steps, like I put something in the crock pot. It's cooking while I'm sleeping wow. and it isn't a big fuss. So just looking at nice, easy recipes. And then you got some friends here. I'm sure they don't mind coming to your we house to eat. Yeah. We're on the little so close. Like I live in London there, they live in Manchester. Oh, okay, you got and, a distance um, issue. Yeah. Here. So you gotta meet halfway, bring your food and sort something out. I'm always <laughs> cooking and I end up throwing away more food than oh, I Oh, that's eat hard. Because I cook thinking. You used, used to, to cooking a lot. Because yeah. I live in a 62 and older. Okay, yeah. And I used to take food down to people, yeah. you know, and stuff. But it's, you kind of get embarrassed because, you know, they don't actually food more, you know. I just try to, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hear you. to lead me and guide me. And you know what? He will. Yeah. And um, some recipes we're going to be talking about, and I'm glad you brought this up. The apple oat casserole, that freezes well. And for someone, that apple oat casserole, uh -huh. um, that's the, the board page thing. that is on your recipe, but it freezes well. And if you're cooking it for yourself, just one person, cut that recipe in half. Because that recipe easily feeds four to five to six people. It's a, it's a, so cut it in half. That's what you can always do with the recipes. Most of these recipes I've given you is based on four to five people or four to five servings. Yeah, okay. Okay. okay? So just cut it in half. I have another question. Yeah. Sometimes I don't feel like eating. Mm -hmm. I do. I just decided to try to get a little part-time mm -hmm. job, you know? Yeah. So I was working for a wellness company. Uh-huh, good for So I, I take their uh, uh, vitamins. Uh-huh. And, but is that not good to take vitamins? Yeah, no, you want to get, I mean, your nutrition and your food's the best. I know that. So, yeah, and when you don't feel like eating well, then one thing I would encourage, definitely don't eat late at night. Don't snack in between meals. Just drink water in between meals. That might cause you to want to eat, help your appetite. And then if you really... If that still isn't happening, um, skipping a meal, having that intermittent fast, you know, we're just eating one meal that day, you could be all right, and the next day you're going to be ready to eat. So that's an idea, too. All right, the food is ready. What I'm going to do is, um, Joe, would you mind having a blessing on the food? Sure. You all can, what you all can do, and Carla's going to put out some saran wrap.